Hey everybody, it's Bart, and I want to talk to you for a little bit about macros in Rust. Uh, macros are one of these things that a lot of programming languages have, and I want to today talk a little bit about how the Rust ones are special and how you might use them in your programs to actually get nice things done. So that's the plan for today. Uh, macros are been around in computing forever, absolutely. The idea is a really simple idea, and those of you who've seen CPP or seen macros in LaTeX or seen macros in other fancier languages, I've used ones in Lisp and M4 and Scheme, you know what the idea is here. The idea is that you're going to uh, have some text which among other things contains some descriptions of how you might convert the rest of your text in such a way that it's got what you want in it so that isn't very specific so the obvious thing to do is to say in your macro preprocessor um, in your program you say well every time you see the string X then um, substitute hello. Let's actually take a look at what something like that would look like. That should be easy enough. So um, let's go take a look at a screen here. So if I say pound define x hello in my C program, then um, every time I say X, it will be expanded to hello. And so that's a macro expansion. It's literally a textual thing. It happens before the program is even compiled. And so it gives us an opportunity to do some funny textual stuff. Uh, the in C++ or C++ CPP the C preprocessor excuse me um macros are pretty restricted in their format the thing on the left has to absolutely just be either a bare identifier or an identifier with arguments the thing on the right has to be a valid token stream and the macro preprocessor knows about stream tokenization. So I can define something like this in C. Um, uh, X times X. And that looks fantastic. And now anywhere where I write square of two, uh, it will be replaced by two times two and anywhere I write um, square of one plus one, it will be replaced by one times one plus one times one. Uh, let's see what we get. Ooh, ooh, that first thing looks pretty neat. The second thing doesn't look so good, right? Um, the macro preprocessor has literally textually stuck in one plus one wherever it sees X. And unfortunately, what we get there is one plus one times one plus one is three, which isn't really the square of two. So that isn't good. We're gonna have to figure out what we wanna do there. So that's the C preprocessor, um, what be. We use it a lot. Uh, we, it's a important part of C programming, I think. What we should think about is whether Rust doesn't have a thing too. Sure enough, it does. Um, and we, in fact, Rust doesn't just have a macro system. Rust has two different macro systems because, of course, it does. One of them is the declarative macro system, which is built into the compiler and gives you rules and matching, something like the C preprocessor does. The other one is the procedural macro system. It's also built into the compiler. And that one is a bit fancier. Um, that one 
instead of you describe declarative rules about how your macro will be processed, you actually write Rust code to process token trees. <coughs> and so the compiler will actually call your Rust token tree processing code at compile time, which is an interesting thing. You know, the book really only talks about declarative macros. Uh, if we do an advanced Rust course someday, we'll talk about procedural macros and the sin crate and some of the things that you can do with procedural. But the declarative macros are hard enough to get your head around, so let's just talk about those for a bit. So we introduce a macro with macro rules, which is a command that is just there for introducing macros. The argument of macro rules is just as you would expect a uh, sequence of rules and each rule has a left hand side that's what you want to match and a right hand side which is what you do when you've matched it and just like with the c preprocessor the lexer is applied to your rules you can't just say arbitrary stuff that's not valid rust so let's take a quick look at a small example of that um here's a simple little program in the playground that is defining a debug macro. And I have these allow unused here because I want the um, I want the um, thing to not whine at me even when I never use the debug macro. But look at how this all works. Let's look at the structure of this. This first thing just declares a constant. There's nothing magic about it. I have a debug constant, which is Boolean. This second thing describes a macro called debug. You can tell because it says macro rules bang debug. And inside, here's the left hand side of our expression. Honestly, there should be a semicolon right there. Here's the left hand side of our expression, which says I need two th three things. I need as arguments to this debug expression. I need a message, which is some kind of expression. I need X, which is some kind of expression. And I need a comma between them. That comma is actually syntactically significant. And then the right-hand side says, well, if somebody calls debug bang this, this, then um, here's how we expand it. We say if debug, then open curly brace eprintlin and which remember eprintlin prints to standard error and print the message print the debug of the expression notice dollar message and dollar x right here expand to whatever was matched over here and we're good to go so this just expands into some rust code and to see how all that works let's go ahead and first of all let's try it let's turn on debug and compile and run this and see what happens and what's going to happen of course is that since the debug flag is false sure this will be compiled into this code but this if won't trigger and we'll see nothing now let's make debug be true and now we should see our debug message and sure enough it says oh i'm running and here's some five um so there you go. Um, it's not as fancy as the official debug macro, but it's a thing. To see how this works, let's take this thing. And I've got a thing set up here, a cargo environment set up right here where I am. I'm going to nah, copy it out into source slash debug dot r or no example slash debug dot rs and let's take a look make sure everything's cool don't need these anymore cargo expand dash dash color none because it doesn't work very well in my terminal dash dash example um debug whoops never not none and here's what it expands to. So this is, you can say, if you want this for yourself, you can say cargo install, cargo expand, and you'll get the cargo expand thing, which actually um, 
lets you expand macros and stuff. And you notice what it expands to. There's a there's a very simple um, expansion here. It expands to this preload import and get the preload in. And then here's our macro use at stern crate stood. And then it expands to this, which is our code. We recognize that. And then down here, the main, look, it's expanded the macro. And the macro expands um, into uh, something pretty fancy. But you can see here our running and some five. And then it gets matched against that. And that's all. because This is all because it expands the Printland macro, too. So now you can start to see how the Printland Printland macro works, um, which is like that. So yeah, that's macros um, as they are. Let's go back to our notes here, wherever I have put those now. Did I accidentally close them? Sure looks like it. Oh no, I just jumped away from it. There we go. So that's the deal with that. Um, so you can write yourself little macros. It's not that hard. It, you can have multiple rules. The macro we saw just has one. Um, if you have more than one, then it chooses the first matching one. And uh, if you have uh, if you have uh, an error in your macro, um, it tends to cause compilation to fail with fairly mysterious messages, just like any macro package. You've got to be a little bit careful about what you do as far as um, defining macros so that they will be used in such a way, because otherwise you risk really bad messages, which are, you know, they do the best they can, but it's very difficult. Let's take a look at a fancier macro here. Let's try this again. Um, so what if we want to allow just no message? Well, we could put another rule up here in front or after either one that says um, just if you just find a message, um, Now this seems silly, and sure enough, later we'll see a way around this, but for now we're just going to allow the macro to take either one or two arguments. Um, and uh, get our semicolons and closing parentheses and stuff in here. Let's see, this is the semicolon for the print line. Here's that, that, that. And now if we run this, we should be able to say this. We also should be able to say something like this. I'm still running here somehow. And uh, off we go again. Let's give it a shot and see what happens when we run it. And it says, sure, I forgot to turn debug to true. Let's try turning debug to true um, and run it again. It says, oh, still running. I have an extra colon here that I should get rid of. So there you are. I can have multiple match clauses. Um, yeah, so that can be really useful. Uh, It's really common to have some buggy things. Uh, first of all, keep in mind that the macro code that you provide on the right-hand side of a macro rule isn't parsed. The input to the macro isn't parsed. They're tokenized, and all you get is a token stream for the most part. And so you're going to get errors not in the first pass of the compiler where it expands the macros, you're typically going to get errors later when the code's actually compiled. And like I say, they can be kind of strange errors. The other thing to watch out for, which is a classic with the C preprocessor as well, 
is the double expansion problem. So let's go, um, yeah, let's uh, see. Uh, well, let's just define a new macro here. Um, how about we define a macro that just is the squaring macro again. So now we're gonna have a square bang macro and it's gonna expand like that. Um, and uh, we'll get rid of this don't you debug stuff and just replace it with the obvious thing. By the way, um, that semicolon, if there's only a single, you know, is a separator, not a terminator, so it can be optional on the last thing. Also, you can use whatever um, braces you want here. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to use curly braces this time. So what do we want? We want dollar n times dollar n. That should be the whole story of that. Now let's try running this and see what happens. Printlin bang <laughs> square a bang of two. Notice that macros always are invoked with bangs, and you can use parentheses or curly braces or square brackets as arguments to a macro it doesn't really matter it doesn't match them or anything and but this is how you would usually write something like this let's see that this produces four which it does and the interesting thing here right is that all it really does is this expression expands to two times two down here and that's cool um but what if we did something fancier here uh let you i equals zero and we'll expand something like this um we'll expand uh i plus equals one semicolon two right and then we'll print uh i down here let's see what happens when we try to do this now remember, this is all textual. And so all that happens here is this gets expanded, this gets expanded. So what we're gonna get here is literally um, i plus equals one, two times i plus equals one, two. You'll notice that at the end of this, the output isn't i is one now, the output is i equals two, which can be pretty surprising, right? Um, here you kind of expected that since I only incremented once in this little block, I only got one increment. But no, the macro is re-expanding your action twice, so you gotta watch out for that. Um, you also gotta be a little careful about, uh, about the same kinds of stuff that we were being careful of before. So what happens if I say this? This will be interesting. Remember in C, um, in the, with the C preprocessor, this was a problem. Let's see what happens if we do the same thing that was a problem before here, right? This expanded to three textually. Um, Too many positional arguments the first problem so let's fix that hey it worked it printed four how is that possible well it's possible because it knows this thing's supposed to be an expression and so it actually sort of cal puts the expression on the left with parentheses around it that you can't see here and then puts the times then puts more parentheses if i change this to be a token tree um, which is to say just uh, something that, you know, is a thing. Oh, then I get no ex expressions, expect the token plus. So I'm going to have to put another level of parens, which will make the problem go away again. So never mind. Um, so the point is that the Rust macros are a little safer 
than the C macros, but they still have some bugs. You still got to be careful about what you're doing. Recursion is absolutely a legitimate thing one can do. I can call a macro on itself. And so in fact, if we want to have it process arguments, one way to do that is to uh, have our little macro um, you know, sort of do some things with the arguments here. Let's let's look at a let's see um, product macro, and what it's going to take is um, um, and we'll start by just doing the dumbest thing, and the dumbest thing here is dollar n one times n two dollar n two, just like we did before. Well. Um, what if we want to also be able to allow um, three arguments? Well, then one way to do it would be um, and this is going to get tedious really super fast um, goes to prod bang of dollar n one dollar n two um and then we need another product to get the result out so we'll first multiply n one by n two and then we'll multiply by n three and hey presto now we have a three element product and it works by recursively calling itself uh, which is really super interesting let's put that semicolon in there just because i love it so do i have the right number of parentheses i feel like i do this closes the inner prod outer prod and expression yeah that looks Okay, so let's see what happens here. So this should print uh, 24, I think, if everything's cool. And so let's try that and see what happens. 24, woohoo! So you can see we can call ourselves on a reduced case. And um, since these each of these calls only has two arguments, it'll use the two argument version to expand and everything will be good. Now, um, you gotta be careful, right? Because I do have a base case here and you should always make sure you have a base case or your compiler will hang trying to uh, expand your macros in the worst case. In the best case, all that will happen is that your um, compiler will complain that you've hit the recursion limit. You've recursed 256 times, and that's too many times. Um, by the way, what happens if I try that same trick with the C preprocessor? Pound define, um, well, do I even have a way to do this? I guess. Uh, prod of a b a times b pound I define prod of a b c as a prod of a B times C. Let's just do one level of recursion here. Let's see what happens. Prod of two, three, four. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. Um, you can't really redefine prod with a different number of arguments and expect anything sensible to happen. And in general, it won't allow recursion. If I say, um, uh, you 
this obviously should infinite loop. But it doesn't. The recursion just doesn't even happen. Um, it just applies the argument once and then decides that it's done. And that is the end of that story. So Rust thing is much fancier, much more like a real modern repro macro preprocessor. Um, debugging macros is hard. You can use the log syntax macro which inside your macros and that will actually print arguments to the terminal at compile time let's take a look at that so let's try that and see what happens um let's see i get up think the brackets matter here um log syntax base case um, and I don't know if that'll even run but let's see what happens oh macro expression ignores blah so um, let's put this and this right here to group that up oh one syntax is not stable enough huh oh okay i did not know that that was an unstable feature so let's try that with nightly uh -huh. uh, there we go oh i need to apparently um interesting so even on nightly it's not letting me do it um all right well but you can see that it does print what it's supposed to print when you um use it and so that can be useful for debugging purposes um the last bit which will take us the other 70% of the time this lecture, is that the Rust macro system has some repetition and conditioned kinds of stuff. And since var args is the main reason, you notice that println is a macro, and you may be wondering why println was a macro. The main reason is because println takes multiple arguments. So let's talk through a little bit of an example here where our debug macro wants to take more than one or two or three arguments. In fact, we want it to be able to take an arbitrary number of arguments. And to get that to work, we need to do look at this thing right here. Um, this is the interesting bit of our new debug macro, is this bit where uh, we take an expression comma plus and there's dollars and there's all kinds of things here so dollar open paren stuff close paren is essentially a sub pattern so this macro this first rule matches two three things it matches an expression message followed by a comma followed by a sub pattern uh, dollar open paren stuff close paren comma plus what does comma plus mean it means zero or more repetitions of the expr separated by commas. Or sorry, one or more repetitions of the expr separated by commas. So now we have the case where there's at least one argument and uh, the commas are separating them. And now in this case, well, what do we want to do? We have an arbitrary number of matches in this sub expression how do we expand them all out well here's our if debug here's where we print the message but you'll notice i don't print a new line yet um here's where the magic happens notice that we have a dollar sign close paren star expression right here what that does is for each x in the pattern it repeats 
this output. So if there are three things, then I'll get three of these ePrints inserted into the source code I'm compiling. And then finally, we close with a new line. So we're going to basically handle the message argument, handle each of the expression arguments with a separate ePrint, and then handle the uh, new line as a separate case. Notice we have a base case as well. If we don't have a comma here, that means that we should just print the whole message. It's not really a base case, it's recursive. And we also allow nothing, in which case we print the debug message. And here we are recursive. We say, well, if you don't print anything, use debug with this one argument case. So let's look at some examples. Here's a thing that has three arguments. I could add a fourth if I want to. Um, here's one that prints with a single message. Here's one that prints with no message. So it'll just print debug. And when I compile and run all this nonsense, I get my Deb first debug message, which is being used by expanding each of these three things to an ePrint. I get my second message, which is just print the message. And I get this message, which is expand it to debug of debug. So that's the bangs. And that gives you some idea of how things work with Printlin and Friends too, is that they essentially use this kind of a syntax and expand each argument to something that prints the associated thing from the format string. Um, if, I, if this class were a little fancier, I would probably choose to have people try to implement that because it'd be kind of interesting. Now, there's a ton of compiler built-ins and facilities. For example, the line bit macro actually spits out the line number you're on in the current program. There's fragment types. Um, we used expr mostly this time. There's also um, identifier, which matches an identifier. ty, which matches a type. Um, tt, which is a token tree. The token tree thing is a little weird and special. Um, it turns out the token tree matches either a single token or just a group of tokens surrounded by brackets. So I'm going to use that to rewrite a macro in a fairly fancy way. So I'm going to say that, so the re-argument macro is going to take a thing that's in this case, a generalized token tree. I'm not really sure why. I kind of feel like an identifier would be sufficient here. It takes a bang. Notice that when we define a macro like this, this bang is actually a separate token. I can, for example, do this kind of stuff. Um, we, we have a, uh, and then we have an open paren, and then we just try to suck up all the arguments. And the way we do that is say, well, the arguments are separated by commas, and each argument's a token tree. It's some kind of expression or type or value or something. I don't even know what it is. We're just going to suck them all up, and then we're going to output the identifier, bang, huh. And that's all we're going to say. So down here, when we call re-argument, it should just replace this whole mess inside here, which is a macro call itself and everything else with just, um, oh, sorry. It, it'll take printlet and the bang, and it will match those to this and this. And then it will take the rest of this stuff, throw it away, and replace with huh. And so when we run this, all it should say is huh. Uh, apparently ident would be a better name than id. I don't know why I typed that wrong. And now it says, huh, huh. So that's, um, that's token trees. Like I say, there's a lot of types. You can look in the Rust language reference manual for them. You can also look in this book that's down here. The little book of Rust macros is fantastic, and I can't say enough happy things about it. Um, people complain a little because it's a little out of date maybe, but it's not so out of date that I think it will ever cause you a problem, and it's pretty much the best book available online about Rust macros. Another thing you got to understand about Rust macros that's kind of important is hygiene. And what hygiene means is that uh, you need to have a uh, 
that identifiers that you can't create new identifiers in a macro and then um, claim them externally uh, because that could lead to some really confusing situations. So let's just um, so let's make a define x macro that takes no arguments and expands to let x equals 3. So I need some definition of x. Let's get myself one and then let's print x. So here, let's clean this up a little bit. Uh, okay, and then we'll we can you know certainly say let x equals three, print one x, and that should certainly work and print three. Um, it'll whine about my natural definition I need to use, but well, you know, maybe maybe the definition's fancy, and what I really want is to use the define x macro to let x equals three, and that seems like it should work too, because look, let x equals three, print f x, everything should be golden. Cannot find value x in this scope. Well, that's super confusing. Let's um, expand this macro using cargo expand. Uh, cargo ex cargo expand uh, just example hygiene and let's see what it does it says let x equals three and then it says print it so why 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 won't this compile I sort of feel like if I do this um, could not compile macros. I don't understand. X not fine in the scope. Yeah, I'm aware. So what if I just take this source text? Um, And rusty minus o rusty slash tap slash hygiene dot rs. Wait, what? Oh, I copied the wrong thing. Um, let's try that again. I was like, wow, that was weird. Um, yeah, let's see. What happens if I just do this? and then do this there we go oh well it doesn't really like our print internals nonsense very much but um yeah so all this extra stuff Let's get rid of all this extra stuff and just get rid of this and um, and uh, instead of what the print ar printlet argument expands to, let's just printlet x. And you'll notice that it stuck all this extra glop down here. We really don't care very much about the extra glop. Well, you look at that, it just works. So why does the thing that Cargo Expands produce compile, but the actual thing doesn't compile and it gives me this funny cannot find x error even though it's obvious where x is well it's like this <sighs> having macros define new names that you didn't ask for and didn't want is a little scary and dangerous what that means is that for example if i say um this and then that well, at this point, X will be written over, 
right? It will be hidden, right? Shadowed, and I'll get a different X than the one that was out in this scope. And so Rust just doesn't let you do that. It's like Scheme, uh, the hygienic macro feature has been around in a lot of languages, and it says you can't do that. You can't do that at all. Um, I can do this, which looks superficially very the same. Now let's see if this runs. So what did I just change here? Oh, well, it would run if I called the macro I just renamed. Oh, oh. So you'll notice it prints three and it's whining here because we scoped out X with a different X. Notice that this is an X we provided, and it can absolutely expand back out into this code. And if we ran the ex cargo expand on this code, we'd get exactly what we expected to see. We'd see let X equals three and then print lint X. And the difference here is that I have to pass the name in. And so that gives me some control because I know that the name is being used by the macro. And so there's less surprises and less chances for scary collisions. Now, all the macros we've played with so far are local to a program, local to a scope. Um, obviously, Printlin isn't defined in the same crate as your program that uses Printlin. So there's some old 2015 rules. Let's talk more about the 2018 rules. And probably the easiest way to do that is to simply move the, um, sorry, to actually make a little crate here. Um, let's make a little library crate here. Uh, and it'll provide macros, let's say, uh, macro rules, uh, sure, uh, we'll do define var again, why not? Let's see, how did that go again? Dollar x colon I did. Oh, and let's give it the value dollar v colon expert. So now we got some name and some value, and we will um, let dollar x equals dollar v. This is the dumbest macro ever, but it will be a nice illustrative macro. Um, let's try building this warning unused macro division well how do we make it public can i just do this nope can't use pub um okay what about this so this is super gross and you you actually have to if you want your macro to go out in a library crate to where people can use it. You have to use macro export above it to be able to do that. And by the way, none of that is really well constrained by the module system. Whatever you macro export is gonna be macro exported essentially to the top level of the library. And in the new 2018 Rust rules, uh, what do we call it? Uh, use and what was the crate name? I don't even know. Macros. So the rules for using a macro are just like the rules for using anything else. I have defined var in the macros crate, and I should be able to say. Uh, define var uh, x comma three print one x and 
I should be good to go. Says, sure, that looks fine to me. And I should get a three printed here and we're good to go. So that's how you define macros in a library crate for external use. That's how you use a macro from somewhere else. You'll occasionally see um, something like this. That's um, so this is the old 2015 style way to bring to import uh, macros from a crate into your thing and that still works it's still legitimate and you'll see it around pretty often which is why I'm mentioning it but um, the new 2018 uh, one is considered to be maybe better style so there's that so let's close here since it's getting to be quite the run here by looking at a thing i wrote a while ago and actually just cleaned up last week or the week before because i found some way to do it nicer and that's this pop count example, which is linked right here. Let me just make sure the link works, which it does. And then let's go over to my actual source code for this thing. And yeah, this one's on my GitHub, not on the CS Rust GitHub, because I've had it for years and years and years, and everybody knows where it is. So let's look at popcount.rs. So popcount here is short for population count. It counts the number of one bits in a machine word. Um, and uh, this is my implementation as a benchmark of, I don't know, a dozen or something um, pop count algorithms so we can erase them. The part I wanted to show you today is not the pop count itself, which we'll, we can talk about some other time, but you'll notice that I've got quite a lot of macro use and that kind of stuff. And I'm just now noticing that this is kind of gross, but I'm gonna leave it alone. We, we're apparently using lazy static somewhere. Where are we using lazy static? Oh, down here for the pop count tables, right? So here's an old 2015 style um, declaration for some macros in a Rust program. Let's go down to the macro rules here. Wow, here's a macro I wrote that does a useful thing that's a little fancier. This actually generates a bunch of code, and this is a common use of macros. Uh, this macro is called driver, and it takes an identifier for what the driver name is going to be. It takes a pop count function that the driver is going to call. It takes an entry name for a struct driver entry. You'll notice that struct driver is right up here and is the um, a structure that has information about the, the about the various drivers, their names, their driver function, their block driver function, which is what we're defining here, and their divisor. The divisor is used for scaling the benchmarks. And so that's the last thing is this div, which is the divisor for scaling the benchmarks. But look at this code pattern. This is a classic code pattern. You, It's declaring a new Rust function. This macro, every time I call it, declares a new Rust boilerplate function called whatever the driver name is. And it, um, fills out that function and the only thing special is down here in the thing is each time it calls um the inner function um each iteration through the loop um it, it iterates a whole bunch of times n times and it iterates over a whole block of random numbers and each time it's hits a new random number, it calls pop count and adds the, the on a thing and then adds it. 
So now I've got a function, a driver function per. Now, why do I have a driver function generated like this? Why don't I just have a single driver function that takes a function as an argument? Well, because I'm afraid of performance, right? I really want to verify that there's no overhead here, as little overhead as possible of repeatedly calling this pop count function that's passed in over and over. And so I do this to make sure I know exactly what code I'm generating. So for each benchmark, I'm going to generate one of these drivers. I'm also going to generate a driver entry, const some entry name, which is of type driver, is a driver whose name is stringify dollar pop count. Ooh, that's kind of cool. What does that mean? What that means is take this pop count identifier and turn it into a string, into a string constant. And yeah, the stringify macro is one of these magic macros that's floating around in the standard library. I then store the address of my pop count function in case I wanted to call it directly, which I occasionally do. I store the address of my driver function in case I want to call that directly, which I will when I'm benchmarking. And I store the divisor you're supposed to use with it. So this um, little driver macro generates quite a lot of stuff every time it's expanded. Let's look at the use of it. Here's a naive pop count. This is the dumbest possible pop count you just, uh, well, not the dumbest possible, but it's pretty dumb. You um, shift the bits right. You look to see whether the current bit's a one bit. If it is, you add one to the pop count. Then you shift right one and try again. And so on a U32, this will essentially take 32 steps to decide whether a pop cap, in the worst case, to decide whether a pop cap is what the pop cap is. And then there's this one line down here, driver. Give me a driver called drive naive that takes a pop count naive argument. It's going to produce a driver struct called driver naive in all caps. And it's going to have a scaling factor of 16 because it's really slow and I don't want to run it a bajillion times. So I scale it down. I run it 16 times less than some of the other ones. And that's great. That's fine. And then I have this one, which is a little fancier and does some bit parallelism. There's a driver call. Uh, this one does more bit parallelism. Here's a driver call. So the point is that I'm generating those 20 or 30 lines of code that were up here in the in the definition, right? This is 23, um, yeah, it's about 20 lines of code uh, for this driver definition. I'm expanding that all every time I write one of these little pop count functions. I don't remember exactly how many of those there are, but I think there's, like I say, a dozen of them. So the good news is all the code for this driver and for these driver entries lives only in one place. I can go edit that code whenever I make an edit, it will be instantly corrected all over the place and all the drivers will be about update. And there isn't that much bad news. About the only bad news is this generates quite a lot of code that you would have had to type in anyway, but it does generate quite a lot of code for the compiler to eat. And so compilation might be a little slow because it has to compile, you know, not only all those pop cut functions we wrote by hand, but all this expanded driver boilerplate. And so there you are. Example of macros and live use. And I think that's pretty much what I've got for you today. I, uh, as far as macros, I feel like uh, the book is really really good on this topic so I would recommend that you read it uh, and if you have questions please don't hesitate to ask macros are tricky the first time I understand that and I'm really happy to try and help you sort them out uh, so thanks thanks for listening